Hello and welcome to our latest webinar. I'm Jeremy Glover, a partner here at Fenwick Elliott. This week I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr Stacey Sinclair and Rebecca Keating. Stacey is a partner here at Fenwick Elliott and she's also Head of Technology and Innovation. This means that she's overseeing the development and implementation of new legal technologies as well as collaborating and engaging with our clients on new digital technologies in the construction industries. And also, as you may know, before qualifying as a lawyer, Stacey was an architect, principally designing large-scale projects such as stadiums and hospitals. Rebecca Keating is a barrister at Four Pump Court. She's also been called to the bar in Ireland. Amongst the wide range of cases she's worked on was as junior counsel in the recent post office group litigation, a case which you may know focused on defects in the post office's retail and accounting computer system. Before joining Four Pump Court, Rebecca also worked at Dropbox, focusing on assisting clients in the large scale deployment of cloud technology. She's also a committee member of the Society for Computers and Law Women in Technology Group and a contributing author to the Law of Artificial Intelligence, a Sweet and Maxwell publication which came out last year. All of which means that both Rebecca and Stacey are perfectly placed to discuss and help us understand smart contracts. What are they? What legal issues do you need to consider? Is there a place for them as part of the digital transformation of the construction and energy industries? And what's the potential impact of AI and machine learning? But before I hand over to them, the usual housekeeping, as you know, you're all on mute, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to drop them into the question box. As always, all questions are asked anonymously. So without further ado, Stacey, over to you. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you everyone for attending today. So to start with, I wanted to put today's topic in context. Now, some of you may have seen this diagram I'm referring to previously. Um, this is the October 2020 McKinsey report entitled The Rise of the Platform Era, the Next Chapter in Construction Technology. And, wh and what this diagram is showing is, is a construction technology industry map. So illustrating the technologies that are out there that exist, and rather importantly, the connections between these technologies that currently exist. Now, the reason why I'm constantly referring back to this diagram, I'm so wedded to this diagram, is because of the significance of these connections um, that you see represented here by those um, varying thicknesses in line. Um, these, are, these are representing connected data connected workflows and connected processes. And these connections need to be made between technologies, between companies, between projects, assets, buildings, and in due course cities. So it's no longer, we're, we're really moving away from this 2D, this world of 2D drawings and documents and silos that are being transferred manually and intermittently. And we're really, what we're seeing is moving to a world of real-time con connectivity um, in the construction and energy industries in order to achieve productivity, efficiency goals, net zero, um, and compliance with other standards and regulations. And what we need now is to understand the practical and legal issues in order to get successful outcomes. So on the next slide here, what I've got for you is largely the, the, the 10 or 12 trendy, the here, the now, and on the horizon technologies that that's regularly being discussed in the, the construction um, and in energy industries. And of course, today's topic, we're, we're here to discuss AI and more particularly machine learning and um, smart contracts and blockchain. So today's agenda, what we're going to go through, first, we're going to look at the technology. Um, what is a smart contract and artificial intelligence? What do we mean by that? We'll then go on to some use cases of AI and smart contracts in the industry. And finally, look at the uh, legal issues that are surrounding this. So to kick off, I am going to hand over to Rebecca to talk about the tech. Great, thanks Stacey. Um, so as Stacey has said, we're really focusing on two areas of what some people would call emerging tech. Um, some people would say it's a little bit more in the here and now. Um, and that's smart contracts and AI. Um, so the, the first bit of tech I'm gonna focus on are smart contracts. And a lot of us will have heard or at least be familiar with the most famous mainstream use of blockchain, uh, which is Bitcoin. 
So you might even have seen ads on the tube or at your local corner shop trying to get you to sell Bitcoin. Um, this is another use of that famous technology and that's blockchain technology. And it's a really fundamental part of a smart contract. Um, we could spend hours trying to unpick uh, what blockchain is, how it works, uh, and we'd probably be here for weeks and still not feel like experts on it. Um, so just for the purposes of today's webinar, um, we're not going to go too deep into the inner workings of blockchain, but it's really sufficient to know that blockchain is essentially a ledger or a digital record. Um, and the name blockchain comes from its fundamental structure. So you've got each record is referred to as a block and each block is linked to the other. And that's where we get the word blockchain from. Um, you can have public and private blockchains. Um, in short, if you've got a public blockchain, anyone can read that ledger, but certain elements of it will remain anonymous. Um, and if you've got a private blockchain, only a defined set of organizations or individuals um, can be the nodes in that chain. So they verify the transactions. And there's different benefits to both, different reasons why you might have a public or private blockchain. We won't go into that today uh, in too much detail, but just to have that on your radar, that's um, what people are talking about when they talk about private and public blockchains. Um, the reason why people are so excited about this concept of a blockchain is that it can form what people call an immutable record, in the sense that once you put a block or a record on the blockchain, you can't alter or change that record without altering the whole chain of records. Um, and that's because each block has a unique value, which we call its hash value. Uh, and so if you change that, you change the whole chain. Uh, and that makes it something which Stacey and I will touch upon later. Uh, it can be very secure uh, and also means that you've got this almost unbiased witness to a chain of transactions. Um, so where does that fit in? Where does the blockchain fit in with a smart contract? Um, there's kind of lots of definitions that people throw about about smart contracts. I put two of my favorite ones up on the screen there. Um, and I think that kind of gets to the nub of what we're talking about here. Um, the first is it's a set of promises specified in a digital form, including protocols, which in which the parties then perform those promises. Um, I think another slightly better example for what we're talking about here uh, in the context of smart contracts is a recording of a legal agreement between parties that is written in language uh, that is both human intelligible and machine readable. And all that means is that, you know, people can comprehend what it says, really, and whose text incorporates an algorithm which automates some or all of the performance. And that is a really important part of what we're talking about when we talk about a smart contract. Um, I've got an image up on the screen there. If you're more of a visual thinker, uh, it might help to kind of think about it in a bit more detail. Um, so this is an example of a public blockchain. So the ledger is public, but the individuals are anonymous. Uh, we've got here that the second step, uh, an event occurs. So here the example is that there's the ex an expiration date is reached or a strike price occurs. And then the contract automatically executes the protocols which have been coded. Um, and the kind of end example there you've got is that regulators can under, understand activity in the market. Um, but if we were to apply this to a construction or engineering context, what you might say is that, for example, site managers would be able to monitor progress on site and see what stage or life cycle um, we've reached in a project. Um, that computer code is now almost invariably stored on a blockchain, as we've discussed. Uh, and it's that executing automatically uh, that it really helps with. Um, I think if you want to think about a really key advantage of a smart contract, it's inherent in the way it's designed. And that's that there's really little or no need for human intervention once the protocols have been agreed. And this is really the key distinguishing factor between a contract written in natural language. Um, so in principle, the result is that there's no need for intermediaries, and the contracts in principle can be easier to administer and possibly lower transaction costs and faster transactions. Um, when you think about that though, you're probably starting to think about what would you use this for and what you need it for. 
Um, so there's no need for every provision in a contract to be written in smart code. Um, that really, there's just no need for that. Um, the majority of the terms will be written in natural, non-computer code, but it might be that you'll pick a certain aspect of performance and you'll say that that should be execute, executed using code. Um, and I think that's where we get into the idea that a smart contract can be a bit of a misdirection or a misnomer. And um, what you're really thinking about is a smart term. Um, so, you know, a certain provision of the contract which might execute automatically. Um, it's important to have in mind, and it's something we'll talk about later, um, that the principles when assessing a contract um, will be similar. So you think about certainty, intention, capacity, even something as mundane as signatures. Um, so the point is that the same principles will apply to a smart contract, and, and we'll touch upon that later. Um, a final point before I move on to smart, I'll move off smart contracts and on to AI, is that when you hear the word smart, you might think inherently there's a need for artificial intelligence. Uh, there's not. There's not necessarily any AI or machine early element to a smart contract. They can be linked and there are ways in practice that people might want to incorporate the two. But in principle, there's no need uh, to think that the two are inherently linked. Um, so on that note, I suppose, what is AI? Um, the reason that Stacey and I are addressing this is twofold. The first is that um, TV is amazing, but it obviously in some ways really messes with our idea of what AI is. There are some really good depictions of AI on screen that you might have seen before. Uh, so if you've seen the Netflix documentary on Google's DeepMind AlphaGo, that is an example um, of artificial intelligence. Or even if you've seen some of the droids in Star Wars, they're obviously not real, but that could be an example of artificial intelligence. So that's more what we're thinking about here rather than the kind of killer robot um, style thing that you might have seen in a movie. Um, secondly, and kind of in contrast to that, uh, the reason why we're defining AI for the purposes of today's webinar is that it's a really debated topic. What is AI and what are the parameters of that? Um, so I think it's useful just to clarify what we're actually talking about here when we talk about AI. Um, the way AI really began was that people understood it to be intelligence by human standards. And um, so it links back really to what obviously Turing thought of initially, which is this concept of intelligence being performative and him applying that to a computer. And that can be a useful starting point for artificial intelligence. So something that a human being can do, um, but now a computer can do. There's issues with that definition though. Um, and I think if you focus too much on that definition, you miss what's really exciting about AI, um, which is that AI can perform tasks which you might consider mundane, um, but superhuman. So for example, processing vast amounts of data in an amount of time in which a human being would just never be able to do that. Um, today for artificial intelligence, we're all still gonna focus on this machine learning as being a key component. Um, and what I've got up on the screen there is that machine learning in short is effectively a form of data processing where the algorithm can identify patterns from that data and instead of like a piece of software being pre-programmed to determine a certain output or carry out a certain set of steps, um, it's set up to learn from that data and it responds under a training regime. Um, so I've got kind of a, a little bit of a, a circle up there and I think that's a useful way of thinking about where machine learning fits in. You've got artificial intelligence as the overall kind of heading and that's you know, the ability to sense, reason, act, and adapt to data. But then machine learning underneath is obviously learning from vast amounts of data. And underneath then, you've got a subset of that, which is learning from various sources, um, which is called deep learning. Um, when we talk about a training regime, what that typically means is you would identify a large set of data. You would give certain parameters for the task. So um, you don't define what the task is, but you might say that the output has to be of a certain kind. Um, the algorithm will then sort through and process that data, um, and it will identify what it thinks is the response to the question, the parameters that you have set. And an important part of that will be training and monitoring. So the more data that it's given over time, the more that it, the algorithm will be able to learn and adapt. Um, and that's something we'll touch upon when we talk about use cases and data later. 
uh, in a way, uh, data is kind of the key holding point for how you get to see the, the capabilities of machine learning. Um, so this is what we're basically talking about when we talk about AI. It's just really important not to think about it as just being software. It's an algorithm that has the ability to learn and adapt and to do things that human beings um, wouldn't be able to do. Um, so now that we've kind of got a handle on the tech, um, Stacey and I are going to talk about a few use cases. And Stacey, I'll run through a couple first, and then uh, you're going to do yours, which is great. Um, so these are the ones we're going to talk about here. We've got, uh, I'm going to talk about DNN and generative design, an automated vehicle. And then Stacey's going to talk about another use case of AI and also smart contracts as well at the end. Um, so what we've got up here is, it obviously looks like kind of a, a pretty enough slide, lots of different colors and stuff, but this is actually an example of where um, AI can really help, in particular in the field of design. So design is one of those areas in construction and energy and engineering more broadly that has really seen the advantages of the use of software. Um, but what we're talking about here is AI enhanced software um, or AI assisted software. So one of the really useful ways can be evaluating existing, existing designs and creating new designs. So one of a really interesting example of this, if you want to dig into this a little deeper, is an interview conducted in 2018 um, with Dr. Imnath Az, who's an architect with experience in the digital design. And he was essentially using deep neural networks, which people have called DNNs, to basically train and evaluate home designs based on particular functions. So things like living spaces and kitchen and design um, spaces. And this is really where you can see how machine learning can really help with vast amounts of data. So obviously you might have some kind of assisted software which might help kind of going through maybe even generating designs. But what this is doing is being trained to evaluate those designs based on hundreds and thousands of different designs and evaluating those designs. Um, and what that study showed was that the DNN scores, so ones that were done entirely by a, a, an AI assisted piece of software, were extremely close to the manual scores when individuals went through and ranked through those designs. Um, and so what you can see from that is it's not necessarily something that a human being couldn't do or an architect couldn't do, but it can really save on time. So this task can be completed by a, an AI algorithm in, you know, a matter of hours versus what would obviously take, you know, days or even weeks, depending on the number of designs that you're evaluating. Um, what we've got up here is kind of an example of generative design. So a lot of people will be familiar with um, the current model um, of using generative design, which is essentially kind of parametric design. So you can change parameters to optimize certain design features. Um, but what AI really can assist with here is improving that process in terms of speed and also optimizing the design by just changing um, a, a few features. So let's say in this example, an architect can input variables, including you know, the space, structural strength, movement permitted, sun, wind, any kind of factor you can think of. Um, and usually an architect would then choose the most suitable design, maybe from um, the results that um, a generative design program will offer. Um, but here where the AI element comes in is that it's really marrying the amount of data that you can give it with machine kind of learning elements. So the generative software can identify perhaps hundreds of designs, which might be suitable. So here on the screen, you know, this would just be a subset of how many you might get uh, we've obviously got the same um, shape, it'll be the same position in the building, building orientation, but the space will be adapted, and this might be what a designer would get. Um, but when we have this data-rich setting, what the software can then do is enable it to pick the best examples. So not just, you know, it's not just a piece of software offering you possible examples, it can learn off previous decisions that have been made in terms of design, and perhaps other designs that are in and the database that have been you know, deemed to be more um, aesthetically pleasing towards users and flagged as such, and then offer those designs. So it's really kind of an intelligent way of using generative design software with that machine learning element. Um, so that's one, just one example of design um, which can be used. Um, one example which I think 
some people might be a little bit more aware of is automated vehicles. Um, so this is obviously something that's a little bit more advanced in the world of AI. Um, there's lots of different possible um, use cases, but this is of particular interest in terms of construction, um, energy and engineering in the sense that this would really automate um, a lot of you know, trucks, excavators, load carriers, and even individual rovers that workers can work with on site. Um, and in the picture I have there, you'll see that this is an example of Build Robotics, who retrofit existing construction vehicles. So they add things like sensors, cameras, GPS, and Wi-Fi. And you'll notice in this one, it's an unmanned vehicle. Um, so it does seem like something out of um, a kind of a, a futuristic film, but that's actually uh, a, a t an example today um, of an automated vehicle. Um, Another company doing this is Volvo Construction Equipment, and they are doing prototypes of battery electric and uh, automated load carriers, and they're being tested at the moment in collaboration with Danska. So again, it's kind of a, a today example of the use of AI. Um, the reason why this is so interesting to people is principally from a health and safety perspective. Um, it, it's obviously a way of kind of improving safety on site, uh, potentially approving uh, efficiency as well and over time there might be a costing analysis point to it as well but and the point is principally safety and a way of assisting users um, on site. Um, so that's kind of two examples of the use of AI. I think um, Stacey has another example of the use of AI to yeah. talk about now and then a smart contract yeah. example. Super, thanks Rebecca. Yeah the one the one use case I wanted to talk about um, uh, briefly is machine learning in the context of anomaly detection. So, and by that, and Rebecca's already gone through this um, um, in, in terms of what we mean by it, but this is where the computer is learning from patterns, trends, um, image, rec image recognition. And where we're seeing this used is right through design, construction, and operation. So in design, there's companies out there that are developing tools to using machine learning, look at the anomalies in models or documents, um, maybe it's specifications, maybe you're, it's, it's learning that you would not normally see these two types of um, specs sitting together in one document or those sorts of things, or, go, or drilling right into um, the 3D models within your federated model or, or, or whatever you're looking at um, to, to really get into what is different here that you wouldn't normally expect to see. And now when we're talking about modeling in this sense and the data that's embedded within it, the computer is really best, pe best place to spot these patterns, trends, and anomalies. Now moving on to construction, construction sites. Um, again, we're seeing people using um, and technologies being developed with machine learning, looking at anomalies in what is the design versus what's what's as built, what's been put on site. And so here you're seeing technologies where BIM models are being overlaid on 3D images or 3D scans or 3D videos um, that can be looked at in real time. So it's really, it's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a spot the difference, you know, what, what's different between the design and the as built situation. And obviously that has, um, you know, advantages in terms of defects and progress and so forth. And then what's really, exciting if, if I can call it that, is I think where we're gonna see it going with machine learning in the context of operation, operation of the asset, operation of the building, and the whole life cycle um, going forward. Because you can start to, the computer with its algorithms and so forth, you can start to analyze data in real time. So if you're, if, if with the rise of digital twins and smart buildings, if you're connecting the asset or the building to the digital twin, to enhance productivity, to understand how something's operating, because you know what is predicted how its operation should be, and you can actually see in real time how it's actually performing, um, you're, you're, you're really getting getting inside of those, those analytics, and we can see how it's really going to help going forward in terms of asset management, predictive maintenance to help with delays and downtime. And um, I think the rise of machine learning in, I mean, in assets and operations is, is really going to um, take off quite swiftly. Now, the, there we go. In the next, the, the, the last use case I really wanted to talk about is smart clauses. 
like smart clauses, not smart contracts, because I'd say this is an example of a smart clause, but really fascinating. Um, so what this is, um, it's an example, it's called the weather ledger. Um, and this trial pilot project um, is being done over the course of a 12 month period um, through Digital Catapult and various other main contractors and organizations that are involved. And what it is, is this project is looking at um, the Internet of Things, using the Internet of Things and distributed ledger technology, which um, uh, we talked about previously, to automate the execution of, weather, of the weather-related clause in the standard NEC contract. Now, I mean, rather fascinating. I think there's probably a, you know, a, a thought out there. How can you possibly, um, you know, e execute or automate something, something like that? But um, the progress that's been made from what I can see is, is, is fascinating. I mean, so what this involves is using sensors on site or databases, data, weather data from the various different center, cent centers, along with these sensors to collect the weather um, data. Um, and it's not automating the entire contract. It's just automating this clause within the contract. Now, to put it in context, that when I first uh, heard about learned of smart contracts, now this has probably been overdone in so many other webinars that are, you know, from the data scientists and the, you know, the gurus of it. But when I, this really sort of hit home for me, what is a smart contract or a smart clause? And it's been described as a vending machine. So, a smart contract. You put the money into the vending machine. You choose your snack, and your snack is dispensed. So the execution of that contract is the snack dispensed. Now, if I have to relate that to what the, the weather ledger is doing um, in terms of um, the NEC contract, we're looking at the um, weather-related clause. So it's taking the weather data from the sensors and other databases. Adding on top of that, are the contract conditions met? So there's a series of conditions. Have the early um, warning notices have been given, has the notification been given to the project manager and so forth, Has have the contract conditions been met, out pops your compensation event. Okay, I've radically oversimplified that, but that is the, that is the flow of the clause that they're trying to automate. So has, has the um, frequency of, is it a one in 10 year um, um, weather event? Have these conditions been met? Yes, it's a, C, a compensation event. Now, whether or not payment flows from that immediately or whether or not it's just a, a, a validation of, of such compensation event, nonetheless, this is what this project is looking at. And I think this is a really exciting exa example of, and just a tip of the iceberg example of, of where the construction industry is, is going with this. So that's my example of um, a smart clause um, rather than an entirely executed smart contract. Um, just quickly, there are other examples out there um, that people are investigating because obviously um, smart clauses exist in other industries such as banking and finance and so forth. So there is that potential to use smart clauses for the automation of payments. Maybe it's based on a milestone or based on an event, the automation of ordering materials. And, I th and as, Rebecca as Rebecca described about blockchain, um, fantastic possibilities about recording um, and keeping that record. Um, so you can see the potential going forward of, of, of tracking and documenting deliverables, recording, recording and monitoring events, transactions that have that transparency and have that permanency as, as such, um, and the potential for shared visibility, project dashboards and, and the like. Um, and, and the rise of BIM and blockchain and asset management is another um, exciting area. So moving on to the legal issues. There we go. Now, because I am constantly harping on about data, data and more data, um, I thought I'd start briefly with issues that I think we all need to be alive to around data in order to get these successful outcomes that projects are trying to achieve. Um, now, you will have heard me talk about the, this on, on previous webinars, so I'm just going to go through it at, at a high level so Re Rebecca can come on to the, some of the other really um, interesting legal issues around these technologies. But data, there's a lot of it in construction and energy, and it's only set to increase exponentially. So we 
need to think about these issues. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it, we're really moving, I, I suppose in some sectors glacially and other sectors more quickly, from that 2D siloed data being transferred manually and intermittently to this world of real-time connection. Data, information, models flowing seamlessly, arguably, um, to get these and achieve these outcomes that we're all after. So what we need to think about are what are the data issues around that? Now, the three that I'm gonna just touch on very briefly, access to data, the data usage and expectations, how is it being used and what do people expect it to be used for, and then licensing. Now, with access to data, um, what do we need to think about? You know, do you have a right to access that data now? What happens in the event of non-payment? What's the platform gonna look like in six to 12 years time? If you're using um, the blockchain um, and um, ledger technology, what does that look like? How can you access it? And, and so forth. You know, how is data, does it necessarily, well, in certain situations, definitely, um, does it need to be backed up or uh, extracted on the completion of the project? What happens then when you hand over um, um, data? How is the client going to access it at that point? And some of these issues really need to be thought up, need to be thought about upfront at the outset of the project. And the example of Trent Engineering, not the recent one, but the one from 2017, um, that's an example of access to data in an event, in a situation where one party hadn't been paid. So um, access was revoked. Now, the next one was the right to use data. And I think this is ever so important considering the connections of technology that need to be made to make the likes of digital twins, smart buildings, and so forth work. Um, do you have the right to use that data or that database? Um, and again, this is this is the example of um, the case of 77 meters versus ordnance survey, in which 77 was using data or a database. And the question there was that um, ordnance survey had 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 created. Um, did they have that right to do so? Did the ordnance survey company have database rights? Um, and, and was um, 77M entitled, or did they have a license to use it? So definitely when we're talking about data flowing, using data, do, do you have that right? Um, and there's a more recent um, case of software solutions versus 365 Health, and that contains um, issues of copyright, of database rights issues, and it's really important to understand, do you have those rights? Do you have those licenses? be it um, an express term in the contracts um, or implied. And in terms of data usage and expectations, um, is the data going to be used at the end of the day, what you thought it was going to be used for? Um, or has it, has it not been discussed at all? Um, the, the case of Premier Engineering, it hadn't been discussed. And, and actually, what data was going to be used to value the works? It hadn't been discussed, there was a dispute, and um, in due course, it actually came down to the judge to decide which data was going to be used to value the works. Was it the turnstile data? Was it the um, bio clocks, biometric clocks? Or was it the timesheets? Um, so we need to think about where that data is gonna be used and how it's gonna be used and, and, the, and the expected outcomes of it. And with that, I'm gonna pass back over to Rebecca to talk about um, the next legal issues. Fab, thanks Stacey. Um, so Stacey's obviously touched upon their data, which is really the building block of all the rest of the legal issues I'm going to talk about now. So I think it's great that we flagged at the outset. That's something you need to think about uh, from the beginning and not when things just go bad. Um, first, in terms of where are we now in terms of the law on AI and smart contracts? And what I mean by that is direct kind of law that has been designed uh, to kind of talk about some of the issues here. Um, especially when Stacey and I talk about all these exciting examples of what might happen and where we might be, you can get the impression that there is no actual, how could there possibly be law on it um, when we don't even really have you know day-to-day -day use of all this exciting technology. Um, but the important point to flag is that there is, uh, and so it's something to be aware of 
uh, from the beginning of using this technology rather than just when things go bad. Um, the first point there is there's a really helpful legal statement on smart contracts and crypto assets. Um, it's not in and of itself legally binding. It has actually been applied in a number of uh, crypto asset cases in this jurisdiction. Uh, and in terms of the crypto asset element, the courts have approved that statement as being you know, a fair summary of the law. So to the extent that we ever get, um, well, we'll get, but at some point in the future, a case directly dealing with smart contracts, I'm sure that this statement will be referred to. Um, in short, um, what the statement says about smart contracts is that they're capable um, of meeting the requirements under English law of a contract uh, and that you would look to this, the same principles you would look to in interpreting a contract written in natural language. So those points I flagged at the beginning, capacity, intention, consideration, signatures, and they're all the points that the court would likely have regard to. Um, so I think that's really important to flag that uh, to the extent that someone embarks upon a smart contract or a smart clause, uh, as Stacey has highlighted, this would be a useful place to start looking uh, at what the law is in the area and reminding yourself that uh, the usual principles will apply. So just make sure that you've ticked all those boxes you naturally would if you were doing a contract in natural language. Um, as I've said, there's been quite a few cases in this jurisdiction on crypto assets. We haven't had a case directly dealing with smart contracts yet. Um, a useful case is one that I flagged up there, the B2C2, which is a Singaporean decision. And um, there's the 2019 and then 2020 where the case was on appeal. Um, it primarily deals with crypto assets, but it is useful in respect of smart contracts. Essentially, the doctrine of mistake um, was applied uh, to a smart contract uh, in the same way that it would have been um, had it been a natural contract. There was obviously lots of interesting points about how it differed or varied in light of the fact it was a smart clause. Um, but I think the point to remember there is that the court was still looking at uh, traditional law there uh, in terms of applying principles to a smart contract. Um, in terms of AI, there's obviously no statute specifically dedicated to AI, but there are lots of pockets of different pieces of legislation which deal with AI. Um, I've put up some examples there. We've got uh, autonomous vehicles. So to the extent that you were to use uh, an excavator on site, which was uh, you know, automated, that you'd want to be looking into the legislative provisions that deal with that. Um, there's different legislative provisions dealing with the copyright of designs generated by AI. And um, so that's another point to think about and also AI specific aspects of data protection law. That's really more to do with transparency and processing, but it might be something that would be important in particular when you're picking your data set, um, which is something that Stacey has touched upon. Um, there's lots of areas of the law, which I think in respect of AI will be the subject of debate and maybe even change um, over the next decade or so. For example, the law on agency when it comes to AI. Uh, whether you know AI could count as, as an, your agent, uh, and also how the law on vicarious liability would work. Um, those changes haven't come into place, but the point is just to think about over time that this is an area of law where I, I'm sure there will be change. Um, in terms then of um, some different examples um, that we could think about in terms of legal issues to do with smart contracts and AI, there are lots we could pick. Um, the first one I've picked in terms of interpreting a smart contract um, in the event of disagreement um, is really to say that there's no reason why the rules of normal construction and interpretation wouldn't apply. Indeed, that's what the legal statement on smart contracts says would likely happen. Um, I think that you do need to think about how that would actually work in practice. So it's obviously fine to say in principle, the normal rules would apply, but in practice, it would be different because you've got a smart clause. Um, where there's a provision that exists purely in code, it's obviously not subject to the normal way that you would go about or the normal exercise of interpretation. Um, so it might mean that you know, a judge would need some expert input into what the meaning of the code meant um, in terms of an explanation of how that converted to natural language. Um, but I think that's something that you should be forward looking and thinking about. So to the extent that you use a smart clause, um, it's important to think about how would this be translated into natural language and does it communicate what we think it does. Um, 
the other point is that a judge would likely look at the wider terms in the contract and, and may even look beyond the four corners of the contract depending on what the disagreement is um, so therefore, if you do use a smart clause, I would be mindful of thinking about the broader context of that clause and how it would fit in with the natural language provisions that you've used. Um, I've got some kind of points, I think practical points at the end there that I think you should think about if you're drafting your clause. So I think you'd want to think about what are you trying to gain here from using a smart clause? So Stacey went through that really exciting example um of, of maybe you know the weather provision um you know what you want to think about there is what are we trying to do is it that uh we're not going to automate payment for example but we just want it to be a record of what happened and just have that objective in mind when you're designing it um the second point is to make sure that you really understand how the protocols are phrased so understandably a lot of people uh, don't know how to uh, read or write uh, in code it's not going to be something you're just going to take up for the off chance that this happens. Um, but to the extent you find yourself in that situation of trying to understand it, just make sure that you, you know, you, you ask someone to explain to you in a step-by-step -step way in clear language how the protocol will work. Um, so I suppose your vending machine doesn't uh, shove out a Mars bar instead of Snickers or whatever um, you were hoping for under Stacey's uh, analogy. Um, the final point then is just parameters of risk. So in particular, if you're going to think about using it for payment, just make sure that you think about, you know, what's the opportunity for risk here? How big could the payment be under this protocol? Could we be liable for, you know, a huge payment? Or is it actually capped that this is really only to deal with payments of maybe up to a couple of thousand pounds, for example? Um, what you don't want to do is it all be working kind of okay, but the one disputed one you ever have is worth a couple of million pounds. So just think about the parameters of risk and, and how you guard against that. Um, the next point is just about physical damage, pure economic loss, uh, and professional obligations here. Um, there's a lot of debate in these areas in terms of how uh, this law applies. Um, I've just set out some of the examples there on the slides uh, in terms of what the normal claims would be. Um, my point really um, is just this. So I've got the quote here and that we're all well familiar with. Um, the categories of negligence are never closed. Uh, an ominous statement from 1932. So uh, the point is really, the law is able to adapt to the categories of negligence. To the extent that you use AI, uh, the courts would um, deal with that. And there's also a statement there um, on, uh, in terms of using state of the art um, kind of capabilities, uh, the standard might be higher. So that's just a point uh, to think about as well. Um, the final point there I'll just leave you on is assigning liability uh, in the event of breach. Um, the point here really is that you may get an unpredictable result. That happens with natural language clauses. It happens with people on site. It happens with designers. So the point is that breaches don't happen. Uh, and they, you know, they will happen if you use a smart clause or AI. But these are just some points I'd invite you to think about in the future if you um, use a smart contract. Um, or artificial intelligence. The first is, do you actually understand the protocols or the parameters? Don't be afraid to ask for an explanation um, from the developer or the designer and your legal team to help you understand how it's going to work. Um, do the terms of your agreements, perhaps with an employer or a contractor or even a subcontractor, limit the use of AI? Probably not now because it's very forward thinking, but something to think about in the future. Um, what are the terms of engagement with the developer? To the extent that something happens, can you, um, pursue a claim against them or have they in fact limited all their liability altogether you just want to think about possible avenues of pursuing a claim and if something goes wrong um, and that links in with that environment entire agreement clause there as well um, is this developer who's coding your smart contract or ai model recognized in the area hopefully yes hopefully they actually have experience of um, construction and engineering as well and then finally, just to think about, does your insurance cover events like this and training and monitoring as well? Um, so although these are points that the court might have in mind in determining liability, I think it can also be a forward looking list as well. So it's something to think about before embarking on the project. That's brilliant. Um, Rebecca, Stacey, um, thank you so much. Um, I think it's absolutely clear to everyone who's been um, watching this webinar, that your enthusiasm for the topic um, really shone through, but at the same time didn't prevent you from providing a clear exposition of some of the key issues that we all need to think about. Um, and your webinar has generated a few questions, but also comments. 
um, everyone appreciating that technologies could radically change the way the construction industry is operating and also the importance of people understanding um, how the contracts might change. Um, which sort of leads to sort of one of the questions that were asked and I think given the enthusiasm and the number of times you're talking about fascinating and exciting, um, are we really going to see smart contracts and AI used in the construction industry in this lifetime or is it just talk? I will, um, I'll kick off with that, maybe Rebecca. Um, well, I, I'd say that we're, we're certainly, we already see machine learning. I mean, that's, it's clear, that's already being used in terms of productivity, efficiencies, how can we do things faster, better? Um, so machine learning is already here and, and being developed. Um, smart clauses, a bit further away perhaps, um, but it's, it's being used in other industries, other sectors. So how far away is it? Um, Rebecca, I don't know if you have any thoughts to add to that. No, I agree, Stacey. I think uh, in our lifetime, I think hopefully um, that's the case. But um, I agree that I think it's really useful to look to other industries. If you look at financial services in particular, um, you'd actually see smart clauses and um, AI, to what extent it is AI, um, already being used and even being the subject of disputes. Um, so I think to the extent it's being used there, I think we will see it in the construction and energy sector at some point in our lifetime. Cool. OK, excellent. So following on from that, if someone was considering adopting a smart contract, start adopting AI, um, what would be your top tips, your number one piece of advice to everyone? Um, Rebecca? Um, yeah, I think it's a point that I've probably been hammering on a few times in this webinar. Um, but I would say just really try to understand. I, I wouldn't be afraid of asking questions, getting it written down, what it actually means. Not only will it make you feel better in adopting this technology, but should anything happen, um, it, it'll be useful in terms of um, perhaps an ultimate dispute as well. So that will be my top tip. Uh, and a smaller one would be start small as well. I would just say, um, maybe don't, as Stacey said, do the smart clause first before you do a whole smart contract. Um, yeah, that, I mean, one as well. <laughs> that must be right to help you understand what you're actually um, entering, entering into. Um, and as a, as, a, as a final question, um, someone's been asking about the difference between automating a contract and a smart contract. I mean, are they the same? Mm. Stay. Yeah, no, I think I think um, one can readily see where that confusion might be because actually what a lot of people are speaking right now about when people and it depends on the context it depends on the terminology and, and what you're talking about but largely when someone says um, the automation of a contract they actually are referring to the generation of that contract the generation of that word document in some sort of sophisticated digital way um, there's a number of platforms out there um, that either are bespoke they're called no code or low code that law firms either use or, or parties themselves um, embark on. But that's generating a contract using a using a platform so that the end user fills out a couple of basic who who are the parties to the contract, maybe what the contract value is, and out pops, not really, but at the end you have your um, automatically generated contract as opposed to an automatically executed contract. So, so uh, yeah, de definitely different to what we were um, on about today. Okay, no, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you both again. I have a suspicion you could carry on um, all afternoon, but <laughs> unfortunately um, we don't have time for that. Um, copies of the slides will be made um, available to everyone. We'll email them out to all, all attendees in the next couple of days or so. Um, that only leaves me to thank Rebecca and Stacey again, and just to, invite you all to our next webinar in a fortnight's time, where I, I together with my colleague Sam Tyne and Olivia Liang, um, will be providing an international arbitration update. We'll be discussing working with experts, potential arbitrator conflicts of interest, looking at the importance of dispute escalation clauses and preconditions to arbitration, and also discussing Newcastle Football Club. So hopefully we'll see you then. In the meantime, stay safe and thank you very much for joining us today.